So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I encourage you to look up Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. This is, uh, once you get it open, I'll give you a little context about what we're reading here today. This is deep into the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah was written to the people of Judah. You may know that in the history of the nation of Israel, there was a split in the kingdom between the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. This is written to the kingdom of Judah. The kingdom of Judah disobeyed God. They were taken into exile in Babylon. Then they were set free from Babylon, brought back to Jerusalem, but Jerusalem was a mess. Things had been torn down, things had been destroyed. And so now, here at the end of the book of Isaiah, the people of Judah are crying out to God and saying, we know we blew it, but could you help us? Could you give us a little help again? Could you do that for us? And so when we read Isaiah 64, what we're hearing are the voices of the people of Judah. So listen to what they say to God. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls your name or strives to lay hold of you. You have hidden your face from us and has given us over to our sins. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. Your sacred cities have become a wasteland. Even Zion is a wasteland. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and glorious temple where our ancestors praised you has been burned with fire, and all that we treasured lies in ruins. After all this, Lord, will you hold yourself back? Will you keep silent and punish us beyond measure? This is the word of the Lord. So imagine it's a beautiful day. You're driving down the highway, 90 miles an hour. The music's blaring. You're singing along. You and your bestie are in the car. You're singing harmony. And each of you has a cold one cracked open. It is the best day ever. You are having a great time. Until. Until you see the lights and until you hear the siren. And you know it's for you. You know you broke the law. And as the cop pulls you over, even as she's getting out of her car to come to your car, you're trying to hide the bottles and chew on breath mints, but you know, you know, she is absolutely doing her job. She is absolutely doing the right thing to pull you over. Because this is the deal we have as citizens, that when we break the law, there are people who enforce the law, and she is doing exactly what she is supposed to do. That's the situation Judah was in before they went into exile. They were completely ignoring God's laws. They weren't keeping Sabbath. They were ignoring the poor. They were letting the widows and the orphans starve. The Jewish festivals, which were supposed to remind them of the promises of God, just became excuses to party. They were going 90 miles an hour down the highway, drunk out of their minds, 
and God was absolutely right to pull them over. He was absolutely right to say, you're going into exile. Because that's the covenant they had with God. God had said to the people, this is going to go great. If you choose to obey, your nation will flourish. You will prosper. I'm going to give you all these laws, and if you follow them, you're going to be healthy. Things will go well with you. But if you disobey, there will be consequences. That's the covenant they had, and they agreed to it, and then they broke it. So they know God was absolutely right to punish them because when people sin, God punishes them. This is not a part of God we like to think a lot about. We like to think about God's goodness and his faithfulness and his kindness. But God is also holy and just and righteous and he hates sin. God hates it when we lie to our parents or to our boss. He hates it when we cheat on our taxes or on a test. He hates it when we ignore the cries of the poor or pretend that racism doesn't exist anymore. He hates it he hates it when we ignore the oppressed because it threatens our own power. He hates it. God hates it when the church of Jesus Christ, wherever around the world, aligns itself with empire. He hates it when Christians around the world put their trust in political candidates instead of in him. He hates it when leaders ignore corruption for the sake of the bottom line. God hates it. He hates it when greed chooses our major when we're in college or our job after college. He hates it when lust chooses our websites or when anger chooses our words. He hates it. I got a little vice presidential debate thing going on out here. God hates our sin. So the question for us during this season of Advent is, do we? Do we hate our sin? Do you hate your sin? Now, this may seem like an odd question to dwell on for Advent. We usually think about Advent as the countdown to Christmas. Week one, week two, week three, four, made it! Yay, open your presents. But Advent, like Lent, is a season of penitence, a season when we reflect on our sin, which is why the color for Advent, like the color for Lent, is purple. It's a color of repentance, a color when we reflect on our sin and our brokenness. And you may think, well, that's kind of a downer. But in Advent, we are preparing for Christmas Day. We're preparing for the arrival of Jesus. And the whole reason Jesus came is because of our sin. When we take time to reflect on our sin, it's so that we get to Christmas and we're so much more grateful for what Jesus has done, for his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection. And we do this in the context of a relationship with a God who loves us. We do this in a relationship with a God who wants to move us. He doesn't want to just stick us in judgment and be like, yeah, you should feel ashamed and guilty for what you did. You know what you did. Go pout in the corner. No, God doesn't want us stuck in sin. He wants to move us to righteousness. He wants to move us to holiness. He wants to move us from death to life. That's Advent. A friend of mine recently put a long post on Facebook apologizing for the things that he had written there during the election season. He said, I know I offended people. I hurt people who disagree with me politically. 
he tagged them in the post and he publicly asked for their forgiveness. That's Advent. A colleague of mine during Advent never takes seconds at a meal and doesn't eat any snacks outside of meals. She knows that during this season, when we are all tempted to spend too much and buy too much and eat too much, this is one small way in which she can remember that with God, she has enough. That's Advent. Advent is about saying, all right, Lord, look at my life and do with it what you will. You see, that's what we have here in this passage from the people of Judah. They're saying, look, we know, they say. We know. All of us have become like one who is unclean, they say in verse 6. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. We can all picture this. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. They know that. They know that God is a God of justice. They know that they are sinful people. But then look at what they say in verse 8. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. What they are saying there as people of the covenant, as people who are lamenting their sins, is that they are not lamenting without hope. They are saying, we know we blew it. We know you are the God of justice and we worship you, but you are also the God of mercy and we need you. They are banking on the covenant that just as God was faithful to his promise to judge them and send them into exile, he will be faithful to his promise to continue to care for them and show them mercy. It's like if you had... Uh, paid your fines and done your time for the 90 mile an hour DUI situation and months later you were in a car accident and the cop who shows up to help you is the same one who pulled you over months before well she doesn't come up to your car and say oh sorry I'm I'm just the justice cop you'll have to hang around and wait for the mercy cop no her job is justice and mercy, so she checks if you're okay. She gets you to a safe space. She helps you make communication with the people you need to connect with. She makes sure that you're okay because her job is both justice and mercy. So the people of Judah here in Isaiah 64, they're like, we know you're a God of justice and we know you're a God of mercy. Have mercy on us. You are our Father still, even after all we have done. You are the potter. We are the clay. We are the work of your hand. And to say that is to hearken way, way, way back to the beginning of Isaiah when God says to them, look, I'm the potter, you're the clay. You are not understanding this relationship. Someone's in charge here, and it's not you. So here at the end of Isaiah, they're saying, we get it, we get it, we get it. You are the potter. We're the clay. Shape us and mold us into the people you need us to be. We submit to you. You know, in our prayer, we often ask God for a lot of things. That's often what prayer is for most of us. We're asking God for things. But what if during the season of Advent, we asked God what he wanted? What do you want, God, in my life? What are the apologies that I need to make during the season of Advent? What are the sins I need to confess? What are the things I need to stop doing so that you can start doing better things in me? What are the things, Lord, that are killing me, that are destroying my soul? And you are calling me to live, and I'm resistant. Where is that, God? Show me that. 
Advent is a season where we lament our sins and the relationship with a God who loves us and says, I don't want you stuck in that sin anymore. I don't want you waiting until everybody's out of the house so you can go online and you need to do what you want to do. I don't want you trapped in this lie that you've told that is just now limiting you and making you afraid. I don't want that for you anymore. I don't want greed to be the thing that governs your life anymore. I want you set free. I want to move you from death to life. I want to move you from sin to holiness. That's what I want to do in you. That's the gift our God gives us in the season of Advent, to say, I am the potter, and I want to shape you, each of you, more and more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. I want you to look more like Jesus at the end of Advent than you did at the beginning. So what are the things that the Spirit's stirring up? It's going to be different for each of us. And it could be some things that y'all need to do as a church. You know, you're, you're getting in a transitional minister, which is great. But in order to really welcome a new pastor, however that works, whenever that happens, we want to be as healthy as we can be. We don't want the, the new pastor to come in and find out there are still like old feuds that are hanging on. And I can speak to this because I really don't know nothing. We don't want the new pastor to come in and be like, oh, those two people never talk to each other. That's a problem. Or this conflict is still kind of under the surface, even though everyone's acting kind of West Michigan nice, like everything's fine. How can we use Advent as a season to really prepare our congregation for what God wants to do here? Is there anyone that we need to confess to? Is there, are there any apologies that need to happen? What is God up to in this place? The joy we have as people who are in a relationship with the covenant God is that he is a just God and he loves righteousness and he is a merciful God who loves us. And so in that assurance, we move into this season, praying that God will shape us and form us and mold us into the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, you are a God of justice, and we worship you. You are a God of mercy, and we need you. Have mercy on us. Forgive our sins. Hear our repentance and call us to righteousness. Holy Spirit, as we go from worship today, we pray that you speak to us, show us what you want to do in us. Thank you, God, that you are the potter and we are the clay. We are the work of your hands. And we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.